So <clears throat> this is my last lecture. Uh, remember that last time I finished by proving a certain duality result for cohomology over ZP to the R extension. This was <clears throat> a duality result between uh, the cohomology groups on the one side and the cohomology groups with compact support on the other side. Now in terms of Selma groups, you, you should think of, so using the terminology of Maser from, from his lectures, the usual cohomology just means that you, don't, you have full local conditions, while the cohomology of, with compact support means that you have somehow zero local condition, except that here you impose those local conditions on the level of complexes. You have some uh, uh, not on the level of cohomology. So today I want to explain how to pass to more general local conditions and how to deduce, uh, finally, uh, the pairing which appeared in Theorem 4. So this is section 5 about Selmer complexes. So essentially what one has to do is to redo uh, the usual story except for replacing the cohomology groups everywhere by complexes and then using the machinery uh, that I described last time. So we have the usual data, uh, our number field F, finite set of primes S, uh, the Galois module T with the action of the Galois group with restriction ramification. Then we have some multiple ZP extension F infinity over F with a Galois group gamma isomorphic to ZP to the R. R is probably greater than or equal to 1. So as usual, we write F infinity as the union of F alphas of finite degree. And then we also have the other Galois representations A, T star, A star, maybe V and V star. All right. So this is what we had before, but now I want to impose some local conditions at pr uh, finite primes in S. So I want to really use the elementary conditions of uh, which, which were considered first, I think, by Ralph Greenberg. So the data consists in a finite subset sigma of SF. Uh, all I need is that sigma should contain all the primes above P. So this is one part of the data. And at each, and then for each prime in sigma, I have the local conditions given by an exact sequence, zero goes to TV plus goes to T goes to TV minus. These are the local conditions of the type I described in the first lecture. So these are just ZP GV modules. I also want all of them to be ZP free. All right. So given these two data, one can define Selmer groups, uh, but not in the classical way by imposing local conditions on H1, but really uh, imposing local conditions on the level of complexes. So we'll do, first of all, again, we have the other uh, local conditions on all the other representations. So we have AV plus or minus the obvious thing equal to TV plus or minus tensor QP mod ZP. Maybe this notation was already introduced in my first lecture, I don't remember. Similarly, T star 1 plus or minus V being home of T minus plus V into ZP1. And similarly, A star 1 plus or minus V being the obvious thing, T star 1 plus or minus V tensor QP mod ZP. So this is for all the primes in this set sigma. In practice, one usually takes sigma to consist exactly of the primes dividing P. Now, so what are what I call Greenberg's local conditions? In this case, so let me define them for any of the representations we have that, that will be used, T A, T star 1, or A star 1. And let me fix, let F be a prime of interest, finite prime in S. So if V is in sigma, then the local conditions consi consist in the complex UV plus of Z, which is just the complex of continuous co-chains of the local Galois group GV with values in this sub-representation ZV plus. 
So local collision consists of this complex plus a map into the complex of co-chains of that. So this is mapped into, there's this obvious map into the co-chains of that. So this is what, yeah, the canonical map. This is what happens at sigma. Now for V in sigma prime, which is the complement in SF of sigma, one takes uh, the unramified local conditions. Uh, so I defined UV plus of Z to be the continuous co-chains of the usual thing, GV modulo the inertia acting on the inertia invariance. This again has the natural inflation map into the usual co-chains. Mm -hmm. All right, and with these complexes, one can manufacture a complex computing nice Selma groups. So, Selma complexes. Now, they, these two depend on all kinds of data. So they depend, of, for example, on S, sigma, and the collection of TV pluses. But I'm just going to ignore this in my notation now. So I apologize. So first, let me define them first over the base field F, and then we'll do that over all the F alphas and uh, over F infinity. So how does it work over F? So this will be some more complex C tilde F. Well, so how, how do we do that? So here we have the co-chain, the global co-chains of the corresponding representation. Yeah, so Z is again one of those four representations. This maps to all the local co-chains at all primes in SF. And here I have all the local conditions the sum of all the UV pluses. Mm -hmm. And so this gives me some kind of a double complex, so I take, again, the corresponding total complex. So morally, uh, well, let me just write the total complex here. Morally, I take the kernel of the sum of those two maps, or the, the sh cone shifted by minus one. So this will be my summer complex. Uh, so the corresponding object, object of the derived category of ZP modules will be denoted by R gamma tilde F, FZ. And its cohomology will be H tilde IF of Z. The tilde is there because these are not quite the usual HIFs, as we'll see. In general. And so if you wish, there is some there, there are some obvious exact sequence. Right? Mm -hmm. and so, so let me write the exact sequence maybe as follows. You have H I F of Z, then you have the the global, the usual global cohomology. And then there's the sum, so the, the sum is something like the singular part. So these things correspond to what Maser calls the finite part. And now here, uh, you should take the difference, which is somehow the singular part is what I call UV minus. Well, sorry, HI of the complex UV minus. And then again into HI plus one F where, what is this uv minus? Well, you, you have the, these canonical maps uv plus z into the corresponding well, the co-chains, and then you simply take the cone of this map. So, where uv minus is anything such as this is a distinguished triangle. For example, the cone of this map, the, oh, morally the co-kernel. All right. Uh, so a few remarks. 
So the remark is that if you take something in sigma prime, this, this is, these are the places where we impose the unramified local conditions. Now taking invariance under the inertia is not exact. And this means that, so we knew that we had this short exact sequence associated to the three representations T, V, and A, which in my fancy language meant that uh, the, these complexes of cohomology commute with my functor phi. Now this is no longer true exactly because of this problem. So there's always a map of phi into uh, the, the Selmer complex of the, you apply the Selmer complex to this compact, you take the Selmer complex of the compact representation, apply phi, so there's always a morphism into the Selmer complex of the discrete module, but this is not a quasi-isomorphism quasi in general. Now you can describe exactly uh, the, the error term here, and so the difference has something to do, or the size of the difference, is what is known as the Tamagawa factor in this business. So remember that in the conjecture of Birch's Swims and Dyer, there, there are some terms which are originally called the fudge factors, um, uh, which are uh, the numbers of com components of the special fibers of the narrow model. So you can define them purely cohomologically. So here are interested in the P primary part. So, the purely, so these things are exactly the P parts of the corresponding things in a cohomological setting. So that's how this accounts for this thing. So we, in general, you don't quite get as nice diagrams as we had for the usual cohomology for those Selma groups precisely because of this, of this Tamagawa effect. Maybe this is because those unramified conditions, the way I describe them, are not the most intelligent ones. So maybe there is something, uh, a scope for some improvement. But those Tamagawa factors should definitely appear somewhere. So I don't know. So this is what happens over F. Now, how do we do that over F infinity? We, well, we just use those induced or co-induced modules. So this is uh, an obvious thing to do. We simply replace everywhere T by the corresponding co-induced module and A by the corresponding induced module. So this is over F infinity. So let's first do it for those compact modules that equal to T or T star one. So then remember the modules we had were always Z tensor lambda with gamma, uh, sorry, the Galois group acting on both factors. So one can define again the corresponding modules here in the obvious way. So remember this was uh, also this co-induced module in the limit was also denoted by script F gamma of Z. So the corresponding plus or minus paths are simply defined to be as the corresponding things for Z V plus or minus. So these are Z V plus or minus tensor lambda. This is for all the primes in sigma, where I impose those Greenberg's local conditions. And similarly for the, now if I take, now for, um, so remember that F, then I also get now for Z equal to A or A star one, I had F gamma of Z equal to, what was that, home continuous from lambda into Z. And so one again defines the corresponding plus or minus part like this. Mm -hmm. So one gets the same. Uh, subspaces and quotient spaces also for those induced and co-induced modules. And then one defines the complex in the same way. So, and so you put, so first of all, what I call, so now this Ivasava complex for the summer complexes, so defined in the same way as the summer complex over F, but now for these big modules. So here for this script F gamma of Z, 
these local conditions, this has cohomology H I I F. This is a really horrible notation, perhaps someone can simplify, I don't know, of that. This will be the projective limit with respect to the of the corresponding cohomology groups over the finite extension. So this works for the compact modules. So this is for z equal to t or t star 1. Mm. Here. Similarly for the discrete modules. So for z equal to a or a star 1, one has the discrete Selmer complex. Now let me write it as f of s over f infinity because this is what it really boils down to. This is the corresponding Selmer complex over f of the limit induced module. And the cohomology of this are just inductive, the inductive limits of the corresponding all my groups. Okay, sorry, this is the inductive limit with respect to restrictions of the corresponding cell my groups over the various F alphas. Okay. Now, so how can one formulate the Euler result? So as I've told you, over F, there may be this problem with those Tamagawa factors, but uh, luckily, on the top of the tower, these Tabagawa factors usually become small, in other words, pseudonal. And in Vasava's theory, we usually don't care about the pseudonals. So let me repeat once again the definition that we had in the second lecture. Now for more general lambda. So remember that lambda was now the uh, group, uh, the Ivasava algebra for gamma, which was Zp to the R extension. So, the first, so we say that lambda module, lambda module M is pseudonal. if <coughs> M is of finite type and the co-dimension of the support of M is greater than or equal to 2 in the spectrum of lambda. So this really means that for every prime ideal P of height 1, the localization MP is zero. I mean, the second condition. We also, we are also assuming that it's a finite type. Well, let, uh, let me also say that it is pseudonal outside the ideal generated by P. This is my private terminology for today. If we have the same condition, so if M is of finite type, and we have the same condition, but now only for the prime ideals of height one, possibly except for the one generated by usual P. So this means that there could be something supported at the usual P, but otherwise everything is supported at co-dimension two. And so one can and one gets good duality results by ignoring pseudonal or possibly pseudonal outside of P modules. So as before, let me denote by C the category of lambda modules, the quotient category, when I divide by pseudonal modules, and by C prime, the further quotient, if I, if I divide by the, the bigger subcategory of pseudonal outside of P. So what's the duality result for these Selmer complexes over F infinity? So I'm, I'm skipping a duality result over F because we won't actually need that and it, it would involve some of those Tamagawa factors. So let me do that. over F infinity only. So as before, we need 
a diagram of four complexes. So here we have uh, the comp cellular complexes associated to complex representation. So here we have R gamma tilde F of the complex module T. Here we have the same thing, R gamma tilde F for the other compact module, T star 1. And we know we have to apply this involution I and have to shift by 3. Mm -hmm. So now this works with our local conditions. And here we have the corresponding discrete cellular complexes for FS over F infinity for A. Here is the cellular complex R gamma tilde F Fs over F infinity for the other discrete module, A star 1. Again, we have to apply the involution and shift by 3. Now remember, we had all those functors we had. So the diagonal arrows are just the Pontragin dual in this lambda in linear version. We had the horizontal arrow, which was the Grothendieck dual, to derived R home into lambda. And we also had the vertical functors phi lambda. Oh yeah, I, sh I should, I'll have to make a small correction to the definition I gave last time. I'll do that in two seconds. So this is true, but in which categories? Uh, yeah, so why is this useful, first of all? Because the cohomology groups on the top are those projective limits of Selma groups. And on the bottom, we have the inductive limits of the Selma groups uh, for, the, uh, for the discrete modules. So uh, the H1 in here for elliptic curves will be very close to my, uh, what I called S infinity in my situation. Okay? And so its dual will then be very close to H2 F Ivasava. Okay? And so, I mean, that's the object on which we want to construct our symplectic form. So, in which category does this hold? So, this so these complexes are related by these functors in the derived category of C prime. So, the lambda modules, by ignoring modules pseudo outside P, there could be something, some error term supported at P, but not, but only if there are some primes in sigma prime, which split completely. So if now the in sigma prime splits completely in the extension f infinity over f, then this holds. The diagram holds in the derived category of C, even for even at p. Now, since in the application we have our anti cyclotomic extension and all the primes in SF or in definition in sigma prime are split in the quadratic field, so therefore they are not completely, they, are not, they don't split completely in the corresponding anti cyclotomic extension, therefore the diagram really holds in the drive category of lambda modules up to pseudo null. So we had a better result then. So how does it work for elliptic curves? So E over F is an elliptic curve. We take for S all the primes, yeah, and I'm always assuming this assumption P because I'm lazy. In other words, if P is 2, there are no real primes. So S consists of all the primes dividing P infinity plus bad primes for the curve E, like primes of bad reduction. And I take for sigma all the primes above P. Again, this is not really an optimal, these are not really optimal assumptions because we also have our F infinity here. But let me ignore this. So T, as usual, will be the Tate module. Therefore, A will be the P power torsion. And remember that the Bay pairing gives us Q-symmetric isomorphism between P and T star 1. This is induced by the Bay pairing. 
And so the assumption I want to make is that that E has good ordinary reduction at each prime V dividing P. So we know that, as in my first lecture, we get all those conditions, t 0 goes to TV plus, goes to T, goes to TV minus, for each V in sigma, in other words, each dividing P, such that uh, these uh, local conditions are sort of dual under the weight pairing. So TV plus or minus goes to T star 1 plus or minus V under the weight pairing. Mm -hmm. So this defines the corresponding local conditions for T A T star 1, A star 1, and therefore the corresponding Selmer complexes. Mm -hmm. This defines local conditions. for T A, T star 1, A star 1. This also works for bad ordinary reduction, as well as multiplicative reduction. But I'll say a few words about that uh, in a second. So what are the comparisons between various uh, homology groups of these complexes and the classical Selma groups. And so here are the comparison results. So the first fact is that, so let's look at the Selma group, the discrete Selma group E over F. Let's look at this Pontragin dual. And let's look at the Pontragin dual of the corresponding cohomology of my complex. So I can take my H1 F tilde of the corresponding discrete module. Let's look at this contracting dual. Now this is, there is some duality result over F, which makes H1, the dual of, contracting dual of H1, isomorphic to H2 of the corresponding dual representation. So the dual local conditions. And of course this is the same thing because T and T star are isomorphic, including the local conditions. This is the same object for T star one and T. So these two groups, differ by a finite group. This is because I was assuming that my curve had good ordinary reduction at each prime above P. If I decide to relax that and allow also multiplicative reduction, in fact this would no longer be true because this would be bigger on the account of what people call trivial zero. So this would be this would incorporate all those trivial zeros. That's, that's the correct definition. Because remember, in this exact sequence I wrote to, there was there would be a term h zero of u v minus, which gives, gives you exactly what you need. So in general, the map from my h one f tilde into usual h one need not be injective, and the kernel somehow accounts for those trivial zeros. All right. Now this is really easy. You write the, the, the sequence in question. I don't want to talk about that. Now what happens over F infinity? Then one needs some comparison between lambda modules. So if no prime V dividing P is unramified in F infinity over F, then we have a comparison between what? So we now we take our Selma group over F infinity, take its Pontragin dual, and then let's compare it to the corresponding object in my theory. So H1 F tilde of Fs over F infinity, the values in A. So this Pontragin dual of this is again isomorphic into H2 F tilde Ivasava of T star 1 to which we apply this involution. And again, because T and T star 1 are really isomorphic, including local conditions, this is the same thing but for T. So these two are isomorphic in the category C prime or even 
in C, if now V in sigma prime splits completely, which will be our case in F infinity over F. Mm -hmm. So this means, since we, don't, we only care about ranks of various Selma groups, so we can replace the usual Selma group by my Selma group. And similarly here, we just, uh, up to a pseudonormal module, we can replace our Selma group by the corresponding object in this theory. Well, I also want to say that in this anti-cyclotomic setting, if you have a curve with split multiplic with multiplicative reduction, then Mazur's control theorem relying this Selma lambda module and the Selma group over F need not hold, in fact it does not hold, while there is a control theorem relating those objects in my theory. So that makes it quite pleasant. So now we can get to the proof of theorem 4. We want to construct generalized Castle's pairings, or maybe Castle state pairings, from the duality result I've described. So let me write in more detail what I meant by hypercohomology exact sequence last time, or hyper, rather hypercohomology spectral sequence. So let me take some complex of lambda modules, so maybe even an object of the derived category of lambda modules. So let me assume that its cohomology has finite type. Okay, so what's the hypercohomology spectral sequence? Well, you want to, it, so it's abutment should be the cohomology of the Grothendieck dual of X, which remember was R hom from X into lambda. Now there is a hypercohomology spectral sequence which starts with X i's applied to different cohomology groups to X. So the term E2 ij is equal to X i of lambda of h minus j of this complex X. Lambda. One. This is the hypercohomology spectral sequence. So what can we do with that? Well, there is a fundamental result in this theory which follows from local duality. <coughs> well, it says that those X R, X I's have codimension, the support of the codimension of this e X I is at least I. So the codimension of the support of the lambda module E to I J in here is always given equal to I in the spectrum of lambda. Which means that if we, if we have the luxury of ignoring pseudonormal modules, this spectral sequence degenerates into short exact sequences and everything works in the same way as for ZP modules. Okay. And also, an easy thing, if you take those X zeros, in other words, homes, so E2, zero, J's are torsion free because these are homes into lambda. Okay, this is easy. So this implies that we get exact sequences in this category C of lambda modules up to pseudonals, which are just zero, goes to E to one J minus one, goes to H J of the Grothendieck dual of X, and then E to zero J. So morally, this is somehow the torsion part, and this is the torsion-free torsion -free part. And so this really means, because the thing on the right is torsion-free, then this submodule is isomorphic to the torsion part in this cohomology of the Grothendieck dual in this category C. All right. So this is just some generalization of the short exact sequence of cohomology associated with T, V, and A in the classical case. Except here you have to do it in this quotient category. But it's the same thing. The, the only difference is that now there are infinitely many prime ideals of height one. But, so you have to, but that's the only difference. Okay, and so now 
a very simple lemma says that if M is a lambda module of finite type, then uh, the two canonical maps, the following two canonical maps, so you, you take Holmes from the lambda torsion into the fraction field of lambda, modulo lambda. This is one object we are interested in. Then there is x1 from the lambda torsion of M with values on lambda. Then there is x1 from M into lambda. And there are obvious maps in here. And there's maybe a slightly non-obvious map there. So what is this map? So, so what's the conclusion? These are isomorphisms in the category C up to pseudonormal modules. Now this map is the canonical map induced by the inclusion of the torsion module, torsion submodule into, its, into M. What is this map? This is really a co-boundary map induced by shorting X sequence zero goes to lambda, goes to the fraction field of lambda, goes to the quotient. Mm -hmm. This is the co-boundary. Why is this true? Well, because we are working in this category C, all we have to do is to, uh, to check this after localizing at each height one prime ideal, but then you have a discrete valuation ring, and then everything is obvious. So proof localize at each prime ideal P in the spectrum of lambda of height 1, but then the localization lambda p is a dvr, and then everything here is, is very elementary. So, to check that the map is an isomorphism in C, it's sufficient to check that all these, lo these localizations are isomorphisms. So each, both maps are isomorphisms in the category of lambda p modules. Therefore, they are, the original maps are isomorphisms in C. All right. So now, how do we construct uh, those higher castle state pairings? So they will be pairings on these torsion subgroups. Remember that in the topological case, which I discussed in the first lecture, you have a three-dimensional manifold. There should be a pairing between the torsion parts say in H2 and H2, or torsion parts in H1 and H3, except that those are zero, probably. <laughs> uh, so the same thing should be happening here. Um, and this tor torsion part is this E21 term, which by definition was some X1, but we have now converted it into a home, and that's what we need. So construction of the pairings. So this is a stupid construction, in fact. But there's a more high-tech construction. Uh, use it. One construct those pairings as a composition of two cup products, but I don't have time to explain that, so you can find that in my paper. I think what one should do is to look closely at the topological case and try to find some really functorial way of defining this pairing on the torsion of H2. This, that, that's somewhere at the beginning of uh, the 10th chapter of my paper, and that, that somehow gives you a clue how to get a really nice definition of these pairings. So I, I'm going to give you a really horrible definition. I apologize, but I don't have time for a, good defini for a nice definition. So you apply all this construction to this uh, Selmer complex, which computes this Ivasava Selmer groups. Well, let me just do that for this T star one involution three, shifted by three. Okay. So we take this complex. And so, well, so then we have, so we have, so in this category C prime, there is an exact sequence. By the previous discussion, we get an exact sequence and isomorphisms in the following diagram. So what's the diagram? Well, let me just keep the lemma here for a second. 
because we're going to use that. Now let me draw the diagram on this board. So, so this spectral sequence, or the short, se short exact sequence of the spectral sequence will be the second line in the diagram. The first line in the diagram, so here we have this uh, Iwasawa cohomology for the Selma group of T. Now by the duality theorem, in this category C prime, this is isomorphic to what? H I minus three. No, 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 no. <laughs> of this Grotendieck dual of the object over there. Because H, H J of the dual is the dual of H minus J morally. Except that it's not exact. That's why we get short exact sequence. Yeah. So that was the short exact sequence. What was, what was the quotient? The quotient was HOM uh, from now we get what we've just heard, H3 minus I of T star 1 involution lambda. This goes to 0. And the submodule will be X1. This will be X1. Now H tilde 4 minus I, F. So this is the correct numerology. T star 1, involution, lambda. Mm -hmm. Here is the torsion submodule of this, H tilde I, F, Ivasava. Sorry, this is Ivasava everywhere. Of T torsion. Yeah, this is again an isomorphism by, yeah, because this is torsion free. This line is this short exact sequence coming from the hypercohomology spectral sequence. And here by our lemma, this is isomorphic to home from this the same object in here, H tilde for minus I F Ivasava. Yeah, this is a horrible notation, I apologize, but I don't know how to get rid of all those letters into the fraction field of lambda over lambda. And so those, the composition of those two vertical maps gives me a pairing. Because this is isomorphic to some home, therefore I get a pairing. So the first column defines a pairing uh, between what? So H I tilde F Ivasava of T, the torsion part, and H. 4 minus i tilde f ivasava now of t star 1 torsion part I have to apply this involution and this goes to the correction field of lambda over lambda so kind of so this is a hermitian pairing right it's linear on the first factor you have this involution on the other factor so this is pairing which is non-degenerate so this is hermitian a non-degenerate in this category C prime, or even in C, if there are no primes split in F infinity over F, no primes in the sigma prime. And so this is the pairing. And the most interesting part of that, of course, is the pairing on H2s, and then we get what we need. Uh, but of course, there is the, there's a, uh, there's one more thing, uh, which is not quite, which can't be quite seen from the construction I've shown you. So there's a fact which says that if one is given an isomorphism between T and T star, which is if this is a skew symmetric isomorphism inducing 
the corresponding isomorphisms on the local conditions from t plus or minus v and t star 1 plus or minus v for every v in a sigma, then the induced pairing uh, now I want the corresponding HR tilde, sorry, H2 F Ivasava of T times itself. Well, with the involution is skew Hermitian. In other words, so let me call this the pairing between y and x is minus iota applied to xy. So I don't have time to prove this, unfortunately, because this definition does not give that. And as, as, as you can see, uh, the question of signs in the drive category is not so easy. However, there is a better definition which, may, which makes it manifestly clear. That <laughs> is it in some sense you mission only mod c or mod c prime? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in, in, in this category. The, I think you, you should put a score on the on that um, version five. On the contrary, how, this, this is the down below. That's that's. Is that entirely torsion? You're absolutely right. Oh, okay. Good. Thank you. That was the lemma. That that the, this x one that's was exact. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so there is a more intelligent definition of these pairings, which can be used to actually locate the sign appropriately. So, unfortunately, yeah, the, the, there are some very, very boring things one has to do with complexes and the normalizations of signs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it can be done. And so, uh, so in the special case. So for, if we take now f to be equal to k, f infinity over f, the anti-cyclotomic Zp extension, and t being the Tate module of our elliptic curve, we get theorem 4. Because, as I mentioned, the, <coughs> the Hegner condition implies that no prime v in sigma prime splits completely in this k infinity over k. Again, this is not really important for the proof of the parity result. This is just if you really want to get a nice uh, structure theorem for, the, for this dual of the Selma group, right? Because remember what I proved was that if you take this e over k infinity dual, I proved that this is isomorphic to some m plus m in C, well, at least if P was different from 2. If P was equal to 2, then there's this unfortunate difference between skew symmetric and alternating, which doesn't quite allow for this. But otherwise, I really had this result in C, not just in C prime. But for the proof of the parity result, there's no difference between this in C and C prime, so one doesn't have to worry. All right. So well, I want to finish with two remarks. So the first remark is that, of course, this business of duality uh, results works in a much more general context. So what are the generalizations of the full story? So first of all, instead of lambda, one can work over an arbitrary ring R of the type considered in Mesos lecture. So one can work over any R, which is a complete local Natharian ring with a residue field R over M being some finite field with, of characteristic P. Hmm. And, and what representations maybe maybe not just representation but complexes 
complexes T of, say, I don't know, T dot of Galois representations. <coughs> somehow G into the R linear automorphisms of T, where T is an R module of finite type. Now there's no freeness assumption because in the duality business this just has no place. So what what are so essentially the only thing one has to understand is the relation between those four representations. So then one should look at diagrams of the following kind, T, T star, A, A star, and the functors between them. There will be some script D, there will be usual D, and some vertical functors phi. So if D, let me denote by D the dimension of R, so what are these functors here? So as before, dr is just the Pontragin dual. In other words, you can write dr of some to be home r into the Pontragin dual of r. That's exactly the same thing as before. This is easy. Um, now, the horizontal of the Grotten D dual is not so easy in general. This is our home into what's known as the dualizing complex. Of R. And the vertical map is the local cohomology well, the complex of local cohomology, well, shifted by D, because that this is a natural normalization. Mm -hmm. So what one really wants for the application is just the horizontal arrow, as, as, you, as we've seen. One can construct those pairings simply by a duality result in this direction. The way I prove it, in fact, is by going through this triangle. And the commutativity of this triangle is what's known as local duality. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that the arrows Ds are involutions in some sense are the Pontragian and Gorton deep duality. So this really, uh, this is a very useful picture. And the same construction which uh, incorporates uh, Shapiro's lemma allows you to deduce from such a diagram the corresponding diagram of the appropriate Ivasava algebra for those induced and co-induced modules, everything works. Now what's the basic example of this? Example comes from Hida theory. where R is some localization of some ordinary Hecke algebra, ordinary Hecke algebra. Localized at some maximal ideal M. Now this is important because one can then deduce, remember I had this general principle that in nice self-dual families the parity of the ranks of some groups was constant. And this, a duality result in this context allows to prove the same statement for a Hida family. And this also allows to generalize theorem one to modular forms of higher weight under appropriate ordinarity assumptions. So you start with a form of higher weight, apply the same principle, same duality result, to, redu to reduce to the case of weight two. But the weight two form, unfortunately, will be slightly more general than we use. There will be some power of P in the level. And therefore, one would have to work a little bit harder, but one can still prove something. Okay, I, so that's probably related to the results of uh, which that will be presented by Urban and Skinner. So this was one remark I wanted to make, that there is a much more general theory. And uh, the last remark is that, as, I, as I've told you, in order to prove just uh, the parity result, one does not need all this pairing, just a very small part of that, which boils down to the usual periodic height and its derived version. So let me just uh, show you what kind, of, what kind of a gadget is that, and how can one deduce the transparent result simply from them. So another remark. So to prove what I call theorem three, which was remember the congruence between the generic rank, the lambda rank, uh, 
of, of S infinity and the salmeric on the bottom, uh, it is enough to consider only the graded pieces of this height castle state pairing with respect to the J-adic topology where J is the augmentation ideal, the kernel of the augmentation map from lambda to Zp. And these graded pieces are equivalent to the following objects, so which is equivalent to the following. Well, of course, let me just remind you, so if you fix an isomorphism between gamma and Zp, so that was some little gamma which is a topological generator, then of course lambda will be isomorphic to Zp, the power series in gamma minus one, and then J will be simply generated by gamma minus one. So. All right. So uh, these graded pieces are the following objects. So these are equivalent to the following. These are higher periodic height pairings. On, say, on the compact Salma group, let me call X. This is another X that we've had before. This is X of E over K tensor with QP, which is, if you wish, the bluff cattle H1F for the ZP, sorry, for the QP representation. So what are those higher pairings? So first of all, th there is a canonical filtration on this Salma group. This is the F1, F2, X, etc., which is stable by the complex conjugation. This filtration comes from the geodic filtration on S infinity by the usual, by the, by the control theorem. Uh, this is not a separated filtration. The intersection of all the FJs with F infinity is equal to the submodules of universal norms. These are universal norms in the Selma group. In other words, this is the image of the projective limit of the compact Selma groups X of E over the KNs in the tower mm, into the compact Selma group tensor to width QP. And so this is an object which is isomorphic to the lambda dual of the Pontragin dual of S infinity. So it's very, it, it is just lambda to the power, to the exponent E, where E is the co rank here. This map is almost injective, therefore this is really, this has dimension E. Hmm. Now remember that what we are trying to prove is that the dimension of this space has the same parity as E. So all we have to prove that all those graded pieces here have even dimensions. So let me just uh, do that. So this is the filtration coming from the control theorem. And what about those pairings? We have non-degenerate pairings, say, indexed by J. So the J's pairing is from the J's graded piece of X, or the grace, sorry, on the J's graded piece of X with the values, well, let me write here. If you want to do it canonically, you would get really J, capital J to the J divided by capital J to the J plus one. That would be a canonical thing, but let me, since I'm fixing this isomorphism, well, sorry, tensor with QP. But since I'm fixing this isomorphism between gamma and ZP, I really get um, something with QP valued. I don't care about the, the functoriality that much now. Uh, so this is for all the J's greater than equal to one, and they have two properties. So first of all, uh, so the pairing y and x, the j's pairing y and x is minus one to the j minus one x y j. 
So they, are, they alternate between symmetric and skew symmetric. And the behavior under the complex conjugation is, has the opposite sign. The pairing between tau x and tau y for the j's pairing is minus 1 to, to the j's power of x, y, j. So the first of these pairings is just the usual periodic height, constructed first, I think, by Schneider and Zarhin. Those higher pairings were constructed first by Bertoli and Darmon under certain assumptions. For example, they needed j less than p, etc., because they constructed them as the limit of these pairings at finite levels, which is not the right way, because in the limit, the whole point of Vasava's theory is in the limit, lambda is much better than the corresponding group rings at the finite level. And indeed, for lambda, one can define them for any j's. Mm -hmm. So let me define fj of x plus or minus to be the eigenspaces for the complex conjugation. And simply by, just by looking at those eigenspaces, one gets the parity result. Because if j is odd, then the, pair, the j's pairing is symmetric. Yeah, that's this first functoriality formula. But from the second one, we see that it's zero on the plus part. On the, on the so if you take the product between the things with the same sign, you get zero. And also for the minus part. And it's non-degenerate. Did I say that they are non-degenerate? Yeah. So this really means that it uses an isomorphism between the corresponding graded piece of x plus and the graded piece of x minus. Which certainly means that the dimension of the full thing, graded piece of x, is even because it consists of two parts of the same size. Hmm? Now, what about j even? So then this pairing is skew symmetric. And at zero, there are no cross terms. This is zero on the j's part of x plus times the j's part of x minus. And it's not degenerate, therefore it's not degenerate separately on the, on the plus and minus part. Therefore, this induces symplectic pairings. Pairings on each of the graded pieces, grade J of x plus or minus. So, and so, therefore, these have even dimension separately. Therefore, the full dimension is also even. Grade J, in fact, x plus or minus. And therefore, if I add them up, I'll see that the dimension of the full space has the same parity as the dimension of f infinity, which is what we were trying to prove in theorem three. And so uh, the dimension of x is congruent to the dimension of f infinity of x mod 2. And this was e, which is the statement in theorem 3. And my very last remark is that I believe that Mazur believes that this f3 of x is already f infinity and either f2 x plus is zero or f2 of x minus is zero. Mm -hmm. At least that's what Bertolini and Darmon say in some of their papers, I think. So I trust them. All right, so this is just an indication that one can use perhaps more familiar objects to deduce theorem 3. And this is quite remarkable. All you really need is just the non-degeneracy of these pairings plus their somehow functorial properties to get, get these parity results. Okay, so thanks for your attention. That's all.